The Library by Francis Rosenfeld. Second scene. Welcome, light of the sun, the fairest sun that ever has dawned upon Thebes, the city of seven gates. What in God's name is this racket? Gwen jumped out of her makeshift sleeping accommodation on the couch to watch a glorious sunrise accompanied by what sounded very much like an ancient Greek chorus. Sophocles, a soft voice replied, so close she could feel its breath on her ear. She jumped off the couch and turned to face her morning companion. Antigone, he clarified, we haven't been introduced, I'm number eight. Gwen, Whitman. Hard name to live up to. She mumbled, feeling ridiculous to introduce herself to an element of the set of natural numbers, and couldn't resist her curiosity. You don't use names, we find them reductive. After all, none of us chose his name. Why should we be weighed down by its burden of significance? You can change it to anything you want, can't you? Gwen couldn't help herself. In time we hope to make you understand why your question makes no sense, but for now you may address us as numbers one through eight. There are only seven of us, by the way. We skipped number two, for obvious reasons. In time, I really need to figure out where I am and how to get back to Sedona. These people are nuts. The racket outside amplified, accompanied by drumming and stomping of feet, and words declaimed in cadence by the chorus. They're doing this for your benefit, you know, number eight whispered. The English translation, we prefer the original Greek, our small way to bid you welcome. Gwen got up and stood in the doorway where the bead curtain whipped her legs every time a gust of wind was stirred. The drumming amplified, and she could see now the recitation of Greek poetry was accompanied by ample gestures and exaggerated facial expressions. One thespian was prostrated at the feet of the tragic hero, who looked stern in his stillness, and embraced the legs of the latter in an expression of absolute agony. No man alive is free from error, but the wise and the prudent man, when he has fallen into evil courses, does not persist, but tries to find amendment. Why on earth are you doing this? Gwen mumbled, too shocked to remember social niceties. Why does one immerse oneself in culture? Why do anything? Number eight didn't understand the question. Why do you listen to music? But Gwen tried to protest. Listen, wonders are many, yet of all things is man the most wonderful. He can sail on the stormy sea hawk, the tempest rage, and the loud. But, I see we need to teach you manners first. You never interrupt a performance, for any reason. It is unthinkably rude. Gwen resigned herself to silence and stood for the duration of the play, getting drawn into the story and forgetting she had no reason to be there. When the play ended, the actors took a bow and started racing each other to the lively creek in the valley, where they cooled off at leisure with delighted giggles and guffaws. They returned to the house half an hour later and threw themselves on the couches, exhausted and indifferent to the fact their clothes were soaking wet. Number six rustled up a loaf of bread from a cupboard and passed it around the group. Are you an educated person? A number from whom she hadn't yet heard asked her. The question gave her pause, a strange hesitation for a person fresh out of college. I suppose, she mustered an answer. You suppose. The performer, whom we'll call number seven, raised an eyebrow. You don't know, Gwen didn't answer. I assume that means you went to college, number seven extrapolated. Probably a good one as colleges go, otherwise you'd have answered yes. What did you study? Literature. All of literature. How exciting. Die beste Bildung findet ein gescheiter Mensch auf Reisen. Number seven, be nice. Number four intervened. What? She said she studied literature. Please, Gwen entreated. I just need to know how to get back to Sedona. I won't inconvenience you further. I'm grateful for your hospitality. But if you point me in the right direction, I'll be on my way. Another explosion of hilarity followed, one which seemed to last forever. 
this time without the help of mind-altering substances. What's so funny? Gwen asked herself in dismay. Number four was wiping off tears from how hard he'd been laughing and tried to explain, between gasps, the irresistible source of their amusement. You want to walk back out there again if I know where I'm going, sure, Gwen got aggravated. But you knew where you were going three days ago, and yet, here you are. That's because I got lost, but you're different now, yes, I'm not sure I understand. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but unless you learn how to read a star map between last week and now, it seems to me you're in exactly the same position. Furthermore, none of us knows where this place is, which might make your proposition challenging. What do you mean? You don't know. Surely you must remember how you got here. So do you. That doesn't mean you have any idea how to return to where you came from. But that's because I got distracted. I didn't know the surroundings. If I know I need to pay attention and follow a map. Gwen started to panic. You're wasting your time. Number four. Another number said. We can run circles around this for hours. I'm going for a walk. Anybody need anything? Can you get us some brew? Ah, huh? so you don't know where you are? Huh, don't mind if I tag along to that gas station slash rest area you'll be getting your brew from. She followed a good distance behind her strolling companion, trying to make herself as inconspicuous as possible. They walked for what felt like hours until they reached a clump of agave. Her companion, who she gathered was number five, stopped by a weather-worn barrel, scooped up a few ladles of liquid from it in a large jar he dug out of his knapsack, then rummaged through the sack again until he found a knife, cut a handful of agave spears and dumped them in the barrel to ferment in the sun. Brew. He turned to Gwen, whose existence had suddenly turned so surreal she forgot to question why any rational person would drink tequila in the desert, hours away from human habitation and risk getting dehydrated and lost. A horrible thought filled her with dread. What if they couldn't find their way back to the house again? What on earth was she thinking, following a complete stranger into the desert on a whim? She didn't have any justification for her spur-of-the-moment decision, not one that placed her emotional development above the level of a kindergartner. There might be hope for you after all. No substitute for experience. Number five commented morose, without looking at her. Lucky for you, I'm smart enough to find my place. See, he pointed to a mason nearby, on which she could make out the outlines of the house. How is that possible? We walked for hours, in a straight line, and that's precisely why the expectation you can find your way back to Sedona on foot is idiotic. So, what am I going to do then? She panicked again. Why are you asking me? You're a grown woman. Just don't step on the gravel. Number one can't touch anything that isn't white while he's meditating. It's a pain washing the dirt out of the gravel to restore it to its pristine state. Mark my words, if you track mud on it we'll make you carry water from the creek and wash it off all on your own. Why can't he touch anything that isn't white during meditation? Number five darted a bitter look in her direction, and his shoulders tightened with the stubborn resolve not to answer. Just don't step on the gravel. You can follow simple directions, can't you? They arrived at the house just in time to join the commotion of people carrying buckets, bowls, and jars outside to collect water from the rain that announced itself on the horizon. That's lucky. Gwen tried to make small talk. It doesn't rain that much in the desert. Every Tuesday at four, number five deigned to answer. Really? That often? Is today a bonus round? No. What do you mean? It's Tuesday. Are you sure? Gwen frowned, trying to remember what day it was when she arrived in Sedona, but she found it difficult to put the past week's events in their proper order. Yes. How do you know? Number five pointed to the horizon, where the dark clouds were gathering quickly. Because it's raining. Things made no sense. 
not if one was using one's brain at all. She jumped at the obvious question. Where did you get the bread? Are you going to help or stand there with your finger in the air? Grab a bucket. Or the buckets? Gwen continued her line of questioning silently while she carried the containers outside. Forget about that. Number four walked by her in a hurry. Just help me round up the chickens or they'll get washed up in the mudslides. Gwen was born and raised in the city and had no practical knowledge of what rounding up the chickens would entail. She looked so helpless. Number four eventually signaled her to stand aside and let him do it. Get out of the doorway. They get nervous around people. You're bringing the chickens into the house. Gwen asked, bewildered. Where else am I going to bring them? Do you see any other structures? But there's no door. How are you going to keep them inside? Chickens are a lot smarter than you think. Give them some credit, will you? Once the rain starts, they'll figure it out. Look at them. They're frazzled already, looking for shelter. Chew. 